This talk is not an academic, terribly informative, um, educational tool. What I'm doing here is, what my, my hope is, that I'm opening up a conversation that is overdue in our communities. Um, this is the, <laughs> I've been given the hot potato, basically. This has come up because over the past couple of few years, particularly the past year or so, um, there have been numerous occasions that consent violations in terms of individuals or events have come to our attention as therapists in the client room, in, in the therapy room. Um, so this conversation is hopefully opening up to rotten tomatoes being thrown at me. No, to um, ask yourselves, basically, where do you stand on this? And, and, and what are your chosen thoughts, uh, feelings, actions, and behaviours around this issue? Okay. Um, who am I? That's me. Not to every, anyone who doesn't know me in the room. Um, I'm a trans man. Um, I'm leather. I'm very out. Um, I'm out as out can be, basically. Um, my client practice, therefore, un, 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 no, not unpredictably, completely predictably, is 100% GSRD communities. Um, it's a big practice, a very busy practice, and I haven't had to advertise because I'm very out and very open. There's an entire conversation around that, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. My choice is my choice, and I stick to it. Um, da, 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 da. Right, let's flick through. So this is what was in the programme that you don't have. Um, Non-consent and sexuality communities, responsibilities of the therapist, and a conversation around the missing stare, which we'll get to at the end. So amidst the wider context of the Me Too movement that is currently empowering people to speak up around abuse, we will be exploring here the challenging and controversial issues currently facing us as therapists working within the BDSM and kink communities, including conscious kink, sacred sexuality and tantra. So what is our responsibility when specific names or events crop up as problematic? What are the issues and considerations around reporting, referral or intervention? What about our duty of care to the client, and how might this conflict with our sense of responsibility towards the communities in which we live and work? What if we hear disclosures from the perpetrators of such abuse? How can we work with this? It's my hope that this plenary will be an invitation, invitational to a more transparent, ongoing conversation among us as therapists, that we may discern how best to navigate this challenging work for ourselves. I do not have all the answers for you here. However, by bringing these questions under the light of our gaze openly, I hope to begin a more open and honest dialogue around this issue among therapists. The thorny topic. This is a discussion primarily around and for kink-identified therapists. However, it will also challenge those wishing to learn about and work within this particular field of clientele, perhaps to contemplate more broadly than hitherto traditional thinking in these matters. This specific conversation is around the increasing occurrence of us as therapists hearing within the therapy room reports of individuals or events that are potentially troublesome and in direct collision around the issue of consent within BDSM and sexuality practitioners. One of the foundation cornerstones of kink and diverse sexuality communities is consent. Arguably, it could be uh, described as the strongest positive for our own activism. Um, when you're arguing with someone about the pathology or non-pathology of BDSM, consent is your biggest tool, your biggest weapon. So, where were we going Arguably the strongest positive for our activism, and in particular when debating negating the historical pathologizing of these sexual diversities in the media, wider society, and within our own profession. For those of us who live and work within these communities, these occurrences create a complex and challenging situation including potential conflict with our professional and ethical boundaries, as well as our personal value systems and even our own private life. Kink-identified therapists' roles. Excuse me, I'm going to have to go closer to my laptop because I still can't see properly. Naturally, our dedicated and primary role is, as always, to work with the individual on a case-by-case -case basis, respecting and reflecting the utmost confidentiality. 
perhaps even particularly so for these clients who may be arguably who may arguably feel more at risk from disclosure threats to career family marriage children still a case though thankfully less so than 10 years ago than non-kink individuals due to the rise in these occurrences the questions we are beginning to ask ourselves is do we or even should we have a role beyond that of simply being the therapist Could not engaging in a role outside of being a therapist potentially conflict with our role as activists in these communities, or indeed for our own personal engagement or enjoyment within them? You can see I'm asking an awful lot of questions. These are all questions that have occurred to me in my work, and I'm offering them up so that you can consider them in your work. <clears throat> Do we, as a kink or diverse sexuality community, f have a felt sense of moral duty to police ourselves? In acknowledging the extant external systemic and societal judgment that uh, Darren was speaking of, including media representation of BDSM and diverse sexualities, do we wish to moderate ourselves as a community or to address potential harm from cases of non-consent and abuse? In other words, do we feel if we are part of those communities a felt sense of responsibility to clean up the mess in them? Is it our mess if it's our community? How could we do that without breaching confidentiality? Can we discern our choice of actions upon individual cases with regard to their consent or lack thereof? Is the therapist responsible? This is, a, this is a thorny topic that I've struggled with. Where does, my, where does my responsibility lie? I know and I understand where my responsibilities lie as a therapist. But um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm reasonably well known in these various communities within the BDSM community, the leather community, the poly community, the tantra community, sacred sexuality communities. You know, uh, this is a question that's come up for me quite a lot within my client work. Where's my responsibility? To be seen to be doing or to be seen to be doing nothing? Okay, so what is our responsibility towards this problem? Perhaps we don't think we have one outside of working with the client. Does being a part of these communities or not directly affect how we feel about or see it as our responsibility? Let me be clear here, we are not saying that we do, not advising, not advocating, here's my disclaimer, but opening up the, the conversation to each be able to establish our answers for ourselves. <coughs> this will inevitably be a difficult and individual decision for every therapist based upon your feelings, beliefs and value systems. If you are a part of these communities and you hear within the therapy room about people within them behaving non-consensually or events that are consent unsafe, how might that affect you personally? Where does the familiar ethical practice of unless you are in danger of harming yourself or others enter into this particular conversation around intervention or referral? Still lots of questions. You will have a chance to answer them. What can the therapist do? Further discussion. Could we perhaps empower the individual to simply know that they're not alone, that this has happened to others? So, for example, without breaching previous clients' um, confidentiality, I have been able to say to a client in the situation, in the therapy room, where they have given me a name in passing of a, an unpleasant or uncomfortable consent violation experience they've had, suffered. And I have felt in that moment a real sense of actually it would really empower this client to know that they're not the only one, that it's not in their head, that they're not making it up or blowing something out of proportion, that actually they're not the first person I have personally heard tell these tales. Do we want to go as far as saying we could, if they wanted, put them in touch with other people with agreement around confidentiality? Again, of course. 
What about referring to people or organisations such as Miles Jackman, who's been hearing about these things? Perhaps to talk to someone else in confidence for advice. There are many organisations now in the diverse sexuality communities, such as Gallup, Backlash, Spanner. I've got links on the last page for all of these in case anyone wants to make notes. Would that be a possibility, to refer them to those sorts of support networks? To perhaps be in touch with others, other victims, other, yeah, victims. Do we say anything to an event organiser? This is a tricky one. If the troubling situation is regarding a specific event, would or could that affect our own ability to socialise in these areas? Does it matter? That was important for me, that little question. Just that little bit stuck in the middle there, the does it matter? How big, how strong, how fierce is your sense of right and wrong? Your sense of activism? Your sense of safety? Does whether you go to a particular club or not outweigh that? May do for you, not for me. What if there is only one event in your city and that's it? Can we refer the client to groups of individuals who are providing support networks for victims of consent violations or abuse within these communities? There have been a couple of groups that have sprung up around particular individuals or events wherein the conversation is being allowed, encouraged, just like um, with the Me Too movement. People are being believed and heard. And where you had one voice who took masses of courage to stand up and say, actually, this person did this thing, suddenly you have 20, 40, 60 voices saying, me too. If you don't have contact with those kind of support groups, find someone who does. Because they're there. Sorry, that was a suggestion. You could possibly find someone who does. Should we treat it the same way as we treat unless you are in danger of harming yourself or others? With that, I was thinking more in terms of intervention. If someone isn't strong enough to advocate for themselves or even to seek support with advocate, where does our role step in then? Further considerations, this is a big and thorny topic. What do we do and what are our responsibilities if a client talks about a dubious scene they were involved in wherein you recognise non-consent? As a therapist? What about as a proponent of BDSM? Do we call them out on it? Or do we hope to help them come to some understanding? What if it's just misplaced bravado? This in the room. What, however, if they were the victim of a consent violation that you recognise but they do not yet? Are you able to facilitate their greater understanding? Should you? Can you sit with the knowledge Say you hear in your therapy room that an event is troublesome regarding alcohol, consent violations, etc. Four times from different clients. How might that sit with you? As a human being, as a therapist, and as a member of this community. Can you sit with that? It'll be different for different people. Are you well known or trusted in those communities? So when I had this discussion with um, Dominic um, earlier on, I think you asked the question, what do you do if you're not DK? <laughs> because I do have the ear of a lot of event organisers. I've been around 20 years, they kind of know me. And if I say, oi, you've got this problem, they'll listen. But not everybody has that bloody privilege. I'm well aware of my privilege. Are you in a position to say something? Are you prepared to and for the potential consequences? 
which I mentioned shortly. Should we? If you're not part of those communities and you hear these things, what could or would or should you do about these things? With it. Important to remember in terms of safety, in terms of people coming to you in a position of trust and safety. It's important to remember that in some communities when call-outs have happened, people have been closed down, <coughs> frozen out, ostracised from entire communities, not just an event, because they spoke the wrong name in a negative fashion. Discouraged or disbelieved. In other situations, such as more recently, they have been heard and supported. Perhaps it must be the individual's choice as their consent and safety matters most. The missing stare. So this is what, for me, brought up this entire conversation in the last couple of years. The missing stare. If you are a member of these communities, you'll have heard the names. You'll have heard in passing conversation, this person is perhaps not quite so ex expert as they purport to be. This person might not be quite so um, au fait with current consent dialogue. I mean, I'm really putting footing around here. You will have heard the names. The most recent occasion, many of us unfortunately heard the names for several years. Years. The missing stare is something everybody knows, everybody sees, but nobody speaks up about. So are you responsible for the person who doesn't know the missing stare is there falling and breaking their leg? That was the conversation that began for me in my client room, in my work, to discuss and deliberate what my responsibilities were, what I felt my responsibilities were. You may feel differently. So thank you very much for engaging with that. That's what I was hoping for today, that everybody would engage with that conversation. And you guys have come up with some really great points. Um, so I'm just going to summarise briefly um, what those points have been. Uh, massively mentioned four times in my notes here, choice. It's about the therapist's choice and the client's choice. That has to come first. Um, so initially that came from a conversation around the loss of members of kink communities who've come up against the choice of do I practice in these communities or do I play in these communities? And some therapists have found that, that the, the, the paradoxical you know, existence, double existence there doesn't work for them. So they've had to make the choice to leave, which means that that, that community is losing potentially good people who are thankfully doing good work. Um, the role was another point made, the empowerment of the client. Um, so the conversation was around how does it impact on our role as a therapist and their perception of our role if we are then advocating. Um, my answer to that was around um, signposting, offering advocating, but or, or perhaps preferable would be to empower the client to be able to advocate for themselves. But again, it has to be the client's choice. Um, confronting situations professionally was another point made, which was around, um, it doesn't just happen in therapy, this. You know, when you are given information in a confidential manner and you feel that action must be taken, or should, coulds and oughts, be taken, um, you may be faced with this kind of confrontation. The questioning of yourself as to whether you are willing to stand up, be seen, speak the unspeakable, and get your client what they need, if that's their choice. <coughs> choice, consent, education. So another part of that choice conversation was around our role as therapists 
who are kink aware, kink experienced, kink identified. Um, if we're presented with clients who are on the receiving end of, or even perpetrators of, consent violation, how do you consider your role in terms of consent education? Is there a part to play in that? You have the tool. You have the information. This person might not. Okay, this is, uh, again, not just in different professions. It was referenced in not only kink communities, pagan communities. Now, the one comment that leapt out at me and resonated for me in that conversation was the term respected leaders. Because there's a whole bunch of question around power dynamics, um, not just in our role as therapist and client, but actually with these missing stairs. Because you'll find the reason the biggest missing stairs are still there after several years is because they have a big name. They have achieved a sense of respect or notoriety or popularity or whatever, which makes it harder for people to feel empowered to speak up against them. The person with the power is often the perpetrator. Okay, um, there was a book mentioned, I may add that to links at the end. Uh, personal ethics versus therapy organisational positions. Yes, so basically we have had this entire conversation and dialogue around our personal value systems, belief systems, what our choices are as therapists, what we feel our um, responsibilities are or are not. It might clash with your therapeutic organisation with the BACP, with the UKCP, with any of them. You're going to have to manage your conversation in your head around how far is my responsibility for this information that I now have? Am I still morally, I hate that word, and responsible for pushing it and actually making the point, even if it goes against rules that I've been told I have to obey. Oh, there's a thorn in my um, Mutual confidentiality. This was another brilliant point from the group conversations, which is around our clients have our confidentiality promise thereof. Yeah, so anything they speak to us about in the room is confidential. With a few provisos, potentially. Um, one thing we don't usually involve in that conversation is our right to confidentiality. If you are a kink practicing therapist, a kink identified practicing therapist, let me rephrase that because I sounded very wrong. Um, I've lost my thread now. Um, yes, is this conversation that you're going to be having going to put you in the position of being, having disclosure made about you? Now, one of the, my answer to that, my response to that particular um, question, query, was that I have a conversation with my client. I actually name it in the room. Okay, I have a pause for thought. Is this information I have helpful or harmful? Is it useful? Is it remotely relevant? Does this client really need to hear, you're not the first person that I've heard this from? Is that going to be empowering enough for them for me to cross this bridge? Okay. If the decision is yes, again, I've lost my point. Ah, how do I guarantee my own mutual confidentiality? I say so. I'm about to have a conversation with you. I'm going to ask that you respect my confidentiality. Again, no guarantee. But that's what I've chosen to do. Okay, client therapist roles. Mm, dum, dum, dum. That was I've mostly summarised that by uh, a role of advocate, uh, advocation, signposting, um, the onus being on them. So for me, it's about facilitating the client to take the actions that they may need to take for themselves, not so much about me picking up the phone for them. Yeah, making a phone call on them. Uh, missing stairs of non-consent. It's a culture shift. It's a huge culture shift. We talked about the culture shift of consent. Consent culture as a thing, as a beastie, has really developed and appeared 
in recent years. So what we need to do in these communities somehow, and it's not necessarily our role as a therapist, but it may be our role as a member of the community, is how to achieve that culture shift where actually consent violation is not on. Done. No argument, no debate. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think I've summarised all the major points. If I missed anything major? Okay, thank you very much indeed.